All right, let's try it again. Yay, perfect. Hey, we're good. We're going. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much uh, for coming along. I'm amazed to see so many people for a final session of the day. It's, I'm sure, been a long day. Um, lots of good content. Um, I'm hoping we've all got an hour left in us. Uh, I'll try and keep it kind of fun and light. Uh, my name's Steve. I'm a Microsoft MVP, uh, plus I author and engineer at Elastic. Uh, you can find me online. I'm Steve J. Gordon on most of the social media platforms. I spend most of my time still on Twitter. I won't call it X. Um, and, uh, but I am on the other ones, so you can kind of reach out for any of those channels. Um, I blog at stevejgordon.co.uk. Um, and on there, you'll find some blog posts that kind of tie back to some of the stuff that I'm going to cover today. Uh, kind of going a bit deeper um, into the internals of some of the stuff that we're going to be looking at. So if you head over there afterwards, if you're interested and search like hosted services, you'll find um, some content there as well. Um, this session is based uh, pretty heavily on a Pluralsight course that I've got out. Um, you can see that course is sort of written around .NET 6 timeframe. Very little has changed. We've got one new interface and a couple of new options that I'll run through today. But otherwise, that course is still very current. Um, you can see that course is two hours, 46 minutes. We're not going to sit for two hours and 46 minutes, you'll be pleased to know. Um, what I've tried to do is distill down the bits that I think are most useful to understand about how some of this stuff hangs together and how we can build practical um, background services in these tools. But if you want to kind of get the full depth afterwards, if you do have a Pluralsight subscription, um, you can go to this link here and you'll be able to access the course. Or if you just search Steve, Ga uh, Steve Gordon, I remember my name, Steve Gordon on the search bar, um, then you'll find all of my content there as well. So I want to start by talking about a thing that's called the host. Um, uh, we should probably start with a definition of that because host is a heavily overloaded term in computers uh, and software engineering. I'm specifically talking about the host from the Microsoft Extensions hosting package, so the NuGet package that we can bring into uh, .NET applications um, uh, to give them this host capability. And what the host ultimately does is turn traditional console applications into long-running services. Um, you might be using this fairly often without even necessarily paying that much attention to it in ASP.NET Core. ASP.NET Core applications today are just console applications at the heart. They start up with this host concept, and that starts things like the Kestrel web server, which starts listening on a certain port or ports, and then the requests flow through the pipeline. And that's obviously something that you want to live for a fairly long time, uh, fairly indefinitely, um, as it's serving requests to your users. So that depends on the exact same concepts and features that we'll be building on top of shortly. Those same concepts are also available in a package uh, or a template, I should say, called worker services. Um, and this enables us to kind of leverage this host concept to build long running workloads. So maybe data processing workloads, queue processing, um, or data sort of analysis workloads that we might want to fire up and have them run either indefinitely, if they're polling queues constantly, or for at least a, a fairly long amount of time to do some kind of unit of work. These can be deployed, as you might expect, with traditional .NET applications. We can obviously run the executable directly or deploy that somewhere that we can do so. Um, the most common way that you would be thinking about deploying uh, particularly worker services is using containers. It's extremely convenient to be able to containerize uh, .NET applications on top of the .NET runtime image. Uh, and then we can deploy these into any kind of container orchestration environment and scale them according to the workloads that you have. Um, and this kind of concept of joining ASP.NET Core and worker services together can be used to build sort of microservice-based kind of event-driven architectures um, very easily. And if you deploy the containers, the orchestration of starting those up and keeping those running together is pretty straightforward. Um, they can still be used in the sort of more traditional sense of a long-running service, so actually as a Windows service or a Linux daemon. Um, to do that, there's an additional package that you can bring in for each of those that gives some additional capabilities about managing the lifetime in those scenarios. I won't be touching on that here. It is covered in the course if you're interested. But to be honest, I steer everyone towards containers as the right way to be thinking about deploying these units of work. Um, the hosting library itself integrates very nicely with uh, the DI configuration and logging uh, extensions packages as well. In fact, it kind of depends on them. Um, it uses DI as its mechanism for registering itself and some of its dependent lifetime management services. It uses the configuration system so you can configure the host through the ASP.NET Core configuration system, the things like app settings.json or environment variables. And it will use the iLogger um, sort of abstractions as well from Microsoft. So you pull in this package, you get all of those as part of the workload. And ultimately, what this thing's doing is managing the lifecycle 
and the lifetime of your app. So making sure that at startup, we're starting up this host, that's going to trigger the startup of any of our background services, our units of work that we want to uh, run. It's going to keep the application alive um, until a shutdown signal is re read in, and then it can trigger a graceful shutdown of the application for you. And there are various, I call them events, they're not sort of events in the classic .NET definition of an event. Um, but as we'll see when we look at the code, um, there are various events that we can hook into to understand where our app is in that lifecycle. And finally, it's responsible for starting uh, any hosted or background services that we've created. I'm going to use those two terms kind of interchangeably. Hosted services is the name of the interface. Background services is the name of the abstract um, class that implements that interface. And we'll be using both of those uh, very soon. Um, so actually, I'm going to dive straight into code. I've got relatively few slides. Um, you'll probably be pleased to hear. And I'd rather spend some time looking at how this stuff is kind of hanging together practically. So I'm going to just do, um, to prove I'm not cheating, um, I'm just going to do a .NET new uh, console app to prove that we are literally starting um, with a console application um, from the heart for all of this stuff to work. Once that's uh, created the project, uh, we'll switch into that, um, no, it's not called that, into that directory. And then we'll, the first thing we need to do is add the Microsoft Extensions hosting package that we're going to be using. So we'll add that in there. And that's all restored, fortunately. So now um, we're kind of ready to go. Now I'm going to switch to Visual Studio now. Now you know that I've been able to create this thing without cheating. Uh, we'll jump to Visual Studio, if I get the right window, and we'll open up that project. And we'll just take a look at what the default template of a console application is. Many of you have probably seen this. And then we'll look at how we can turn this into a sort of long-running application. And of course, Visual Studio is not responding. There we go. I was thinking I was going to have to try and describe code to you, which wouldn't be fun. Um, so when we open this up, if I just expand uh, packages here, we'll see that obviously we've got the package that we added. And if I drop that down, then we can see, of course, we're getting all of those additional libraries I mentioned being pulled in. So all of the default configuration stuff, uh, the DI stuff, and the logging stuff there. Um, and then this is, at the moment, just a regular kind of top-level statements um, console application. I'm going to run it. I'm sure pretty much 99% of us have seen this demo um, being run, but I, I like to start at the very beginning here. And it also tests that Visual Studio builds this thing properly. and very slowly, apparently, for one line of code. OK, so a traditional console app. We've printed Hello World, and then the, the process is terminated. We've got an exit code, um, and our work is done in this app because this, essentially, a main method here has finished its work. So as our first job, let's turn this into a long-running application. And we're going to bring in the Microsoft extensions uh, hosting stuff that we need. And I'm also going to be using some stuff from Microsoft Extensions at Dependency Injection as well. And then um, we need a host. Uh, we need to create this thing called a host. Now, there's a definition of a host in the library, which is an iHost interface that a host is meant to implement. We're not going to create our own implementation of that. We're going to use the one that ships in the box. And it's referred to by Microsoft sometimes as the generic host. Um, generic because it can be used to both host the ASP.NET Core applications as well as these regular worker service type applications. Uh, we don't create it uh, by newing it up directly. What we do is use a host application builder, um, and we're going to use that to create our host. So when we call this uh, host uh, static class here, we can get to these three possible methods to uh, create this host application builder. This top one is the one we're going to use. This ba basically creates a, an application builder that's going to be pre-configured with things like all of the stuff that we're going to need to load configuration from the default sources like environment variables, and app settings.json. If you don't want that behavior, you could use this empty builder down here, which will give you the same thing, but just without any of that pre-configured stuff. So if you really want to start from scratch, which is pretty rare, um, you can do that. This create default builder here is actually a legacy option. You can see it returns not an application builder, but an iHost builder. This is a sort of legacy of how this uh, framework has evolved over time, and it's there for backwards compatibility. But generally, you want the host uh, this create application builder here, because that's actually um, much easier to configure. It relies a lot less on callbacks and things to set it up. 
Then we can create a host using this. I'm not actually going to do any useful workload just yet, so we're just actually going to immediately build our host. We're not going to configure it with anything additional. And once we've got our host, we can do uh, an await, um, at least run async on that. We use run async. It doesn't really matter if you choose run or run async at this point because it's you know we're at the end of this method. It doesn't matter if we we block here necessarily. But that's all we need to do to re register the host concepts and make this app a long running app. So now if I build this application, you can see it hasn't immediately exited. It's done some logging to the built-in iLogger, which has got the console logger attached to it. And we can see that logging is coming from this hosting lifetime stuff. So we notify that the app started up. We can control C in this application to shut down. So this default lifetime here is what's referred to as the console lifetime. So it also registers that when we have certain key presses, that will trigger the graceful shutdown. Picks up the hosting environment as production, which is the assumed default, unless you configure that, and we haven't configured that anywhere. And then we get the content root path. And if we do what it suggests and do control C, of course, we break out of that long running application, uh, the application shuts down, and then the process exits. So that's already just turned this console app into something that's long running. It's not doing anything useful just yet. But before we kind of actually build out some hosted services, I want to kind of just show a few bits about these internals and how things are hanging together here. So we've got this interface called iHost. And if I can navigate to the definition of that, then we can look at this pretty simple definition of what a host has to provide. The first thing it exposes here is this um, service provider through the services property. So when the host is being configured, we have access to the service collection, just as you do in ASP.NET Core to add services to the collection. And then when the host is being built, that service collection gets turned into a service provider, a DI container that we can resolve services from. And that's added onto the host so that we can access it if we need to. So while it's reasonably rare, from here where we have access to the host, we could do, actually if I store this just for later, uh, we could do host.services.getRequiredService. And I'll, I'll just get a host application lifetime um, service that I know is in the container by default that's registered as part of the hosting framework. And so it's just that easy to, to access services. So before we run this host, it is possible to pull out this uh, services from this D built DI container if you want to do any setup work. So maybe you need to access some databases, do some pre-initialization of some data. You could do this here before you trigger that run host, which actually starts the host up. Returning to the interface, um, two methods. They're pretty self-explanatory. Start async is about starting the host up. Um, it triggers the host start, which then triggers uh, going in and starting up the hosted services that we're going to be creating. And I, I won't dive into the code there, but I will just drop over to um, GitHub and we look at just a small portion of this start async method. Um, it's relatively complex, but it's, it's mostly um, just about how it orders stuff. So initially, it creates a cancellation token source, and it kind of basically ties together three possible um, reasons for cancelling this startup. There could be a token passed into start async, which is extremely rare, but there could be one from a user from us in our code that would, they might want to trigger cancellation of the startup. There's also a token here that's accessed on the application lifetime interface that we'll look at shortly called application stopping. And so if anything triggers that, something like control C, for example, then that triggers the shutdown of this startup process. And um, potentially, there's a, a startup timeout configured, which controls how long this app has to start up. By default, um, it doesn't have a limit, and so there won't be a, a, an imposed startup timeout on there. But basically, further down, it's going to call into the DI container and resolve any instances of um, this iHosted service. And we'll look at that interface in a minute, because we'll be implementing it. But it's going to find all registered uh, instances of that in the DI container, and then a little bit further down, it's going to for each basically over those and call the start async method on each of those hosted services. So as part of startup, it's starting up any hosted services, which are our units of work that we're going to be creating. Um, by default, that's sequential, but you can configure concurrent, and we'll look at again how that that has an effect on how our code runs. Um, stop async, again, fairly self-explanatory. It's basically about shutting down gracefully. So by default, there's a shutdown timeout of 30 seconds configured, and that allows 30 seconds for any of our user code to be notified of shutting down and then try and shut down, finish any workloads we're doing before the application terminates. Um, you can extend the timeout if you want to. Um, but otherwise, that's all a host is really defining. The way we configure those options, there's a type in here called host options. And if I just dive into what that is, this is the options type that gets bound from the configuration system in, in .NET. Uh, 
Um, and you can see the default shutdown timeout for this is 30 seconds, so we can configure a different timeout if we need it for our application. The startup timeout is basically infinite or not configured, um, so an application will take as long as it needs to to start up. It's sometimes useful to set that because you might have you know, some database initialization work, but if it hasn't completed in a reasonable amount of time, maybe you do want to abort the startup of that particular instance um, so that you can log the event and then go and look at why that happened. We've got these two properties about, uh, and these are new in .NET 8, um, services start concurrently and stop concurrently. So this is about configuring how those iHosted services are triggered. Um, and we'll look at how we can uh, affect those later. These defaults are false, so actually everything will start up sequentially. Each hosted service will start in turn and have to complete its startup before the next one. That's just historic. Um, that's how it used to work, and they've preserved that behavior in .NET 8. But we do now have a configuration switch to set it up so that we can say, actually fire off all our hosted service startups, um, and once they've all completed, the app is ready. And that can improve your startup time and your shutdown time a little bit. The final option here is about um, managing what happens if there's unhandled exceptions in our user code. So in our background services, our units of work that we'll be creating, if, the, if we don't handle exceptions there, what should happen if one bubbles up? And by default, the host is going to stop in that scenario because it assumes that it's hit some kind of critical scenario that means the host can't really do its job. Um, and so it's actually going to be stopped. The other option there is ignore. Um, and so you might choose to do that. It's possible sometimes that you expect certain exceptions to occur, but you want other background services to continue running for a while. Um, and you could manage that in your code depending on what's the right scenario for you. Um, so we're going to configure this briefly. So there's a couple of ways that we can do configuration in .NET. Um, one option here is on the builder, we can just configure this directly. And if we access the services here, the iService collection, there's a configure method that we can use to basically do post configuration of any um, bounds types. And so in here, we could just do option startup timeout equals time span uh, dot from, say, five seconds. And then we've configured a, a startup time on this app of five seconds for all of those hosted services to start up successfully, or we consider that a failure. The other option that we've got, um, if I can find my mouse, um, is that we can go in here and we can add, and you've probably seen this, um, you've probably seen this uh, in applications you're working on, um, an app settings.json file. Did I create that? Um, and then we'll just name this app setting. So this is a pre-determined sort of name that the hosting framework looks for and the configuration system looks for in our applications. Because I've added this manually, I'll need to make sure it would be copied to my output directory. Um, and then in this, we can also use this as a mechanism of configuring things. So here I could do uh, host options. We create In here, we have a shutdown timeout. Uh, and for example, we could set the shutdown timeout to be 15 seconds in this application. So both options are valid ways of configuring this thing. Um, and this allows us to control how this host is actually going to function. Uh, let me just check I've covered everything I wanted to talk about there I have. So now we've built our host, we're then ready to run it. And we saw that the host had start async and stop async, but we don't have a run async. So where's that come from? Well, that comes from this extension method, uh, and that's going to call the host start async on our behalf. So that triggers the startup of the host and the startup of all those iHosted services. And then it triggers uh, or falls into this wait for shutdown. So this is essentially what's going to keep this application alive now permanently uh, until a shutdown signal um, is reached. And this wait for shutdown um, is pretty straightforward. Um, it accesses the services to get this iHost application lifetime thing. So let's have a look at that interface. So this is the thing that allows us to kind of control and manage uh, or, or no, get notified of events within the host lifetime uh, system. So you can see one option we have on here is that there's a, a method we can call called stop application. So we can inject this thing wherever we want to in our application and in code, we can programmatically tell the app to shut down. So we could use that if an exception's thrown that we can't handle or we've maybe finished our workload uh, that we wanted to run. These tokens here, uh, the three cancellation tokens, they're not re they are used as cancellation tokens in a few places, but they're also kind of used in a weird way to provide a, a kind of messaging or event system when these things occur in code. So we can actually register delegates against the cancellation token, and in a few places that's done to trigger other things to happen. And it's happening inside the host framework automatically. Um, 
But we can also do things like on the host here, we could do, um, sorry, on the lifetime that I've pulled from DI, we can do um, on the application started, we could register a delegate here um, that we want to run. Um, and we could just do, in, in our case, we'll just do a console write line. Uh, I'll just say hello. Um, and if I pr now run this application, we're going to see that once this application starts up, we get the default sort of logging from uh, the host framework. But then once the application had finished starting up, it canceled that cancellation token as a method to notify anyone that cared that the application had started up. And so then our delegate on that registration ran. Um, can be useful. Um, it's, it's obviously not that useful to log uh, or write out to the console, but certain uses for this would be maybe that you want to have um, observability type events occur when your app starts up and when it stops. So you can see we've got started, it successfully started. Stopping, it's about to stop and stopped that it has kind of stopped everything that was running. And so application started and stopped. If you had a notification going out to a system, um, you could then track which, how many of these things you've got running in your environment, how long they've been running for, and other potentially useful information um, about the lifetime of those applications. So that's one possible use case for registering those things. Um, that's that. And then I'll just dive back and show you the rest of this wait for shutdown async method. So, the first thing it does is there's, again, a cancellation that could have been passed into run async and eventually start async. And then here, um, this token is generally not set. But what this code does is register that when that token cancels, if it's present, then that triggers the stop application to be invoked on that iHost application lifetime. So if someone's trying to cancel startup, then we basically trigger the stop of the application. That's generally not going to happen. Um, but this code here is what keeps the app alive. So it creates a task completion source. Um, and then it registers to the application stopping cancellation token. It registers the delegate here that basically takes in that task completion source and will set the result on it if application stopping is cancelled. So it's a slightly weird use of cancellation tokens. Um, but this will be triggered as soon as like a control C, for example, is received by the console lifetime that triggers this application stopping event. And as soon as that cancels, then this result will be set. And what that means is that this await here is just going to await a task that's just going to be sitting there um, asynchronously awaiting for probably uh, an indefinite amount of time until someone shuts down the app. And as soon as that happens, that triggers this task completion source to complete, um, and then this code continues. And the next thing it does is then stop the application. So it's all kind of asynchronous based, um, and that's kind of how everything's kept alive behind the scenes. Um, let's see, that's probably probably enough of the internals. So what I'm going to do now is actually try and do a semi-useful workload with this app, because right now it starts up and does nothing. So I'm going to add a class to this uh, that I'm going to call time service. Um, I'm just going to be, because I'm really fussy um, and I prefer Filescope namespaces to tweak those, I'm going to accept uh, from DI an iLogger into here. Uh, and we'll just store that into a field. I'm also going to be pedantic name that field. Um, so this is one of the primary constructors, which is quite a nice feature of uh, recent.net. And then the thing that we want to implement is that host, uh, hosted service uh, interface that we saw earlier. So this is the thing that the host is going to be looking for from the DI container and starting up for us. And so as you might expect, it has its own start async and stop async methods for when the app's starting and for when the app's stopping. I'm just going to put in a, a dummy implementation here that's just going to do a completed task. So so not going to do anything useful. And then in here, we need to start off our long running work. And I'm going to start doing this. A few of you might immediately notice an immediate bad, bad, bad thing that's going to happen in here. Um, don't worry, don't point it out to me. I am aware of it. But let's just see what goes wrong. Um, and then we'll make this work properly. So I'm just going to be a good citizen. And I'll throw if this cancellation token is requested. I'll log um, some information. Uh, the time is time. I will do a time only from date time, uh, date time, oops, date time dot autocomplete is choosing odd things for me today. Uh, that'll do. Um, so we're passing the time to the logger. And then I'm going to just set this work to, to loop, basically, um, every two seconds. So I can do a task of delay here of 2000. I'll pass in the cancellation token here. So again, we'll try and be good citizens with async. Um, and so it looks like we might have got our long running work that's going to be started by the host and everything's going to work. Um, it won't, but let's um, see why in a minute. Now, before I register this, I just want to create a duplicate 
service so we can just look at some other things that are going on as well. So by default, I've created two background services, two units of background work I want to kick off. Um, the, the host knows nothing about these yet, so we need to register these with the DI container in order for it to be aware of them. So if I do builder.services, there's a method here uh, which is specifically designed for this, um, and we can use that to register these uh, implementations. Um, and I might as well just copy this one so that I can register uh, both of these. Now, be, by, by default, as I said, uh, hosted services will start up in sequence rather than concurrently. It's configurable, but if you don't configure it, it's by sequence. And the order will be determined by how we've registered them. So this one will get triggered first, and this one second because of the order they're registered into DI. If I jump in here, I'll just stick a uh, breakpoint here and down here in both of the start async methods, and we'll run this code. So our app hopefully will start up. Uh, our first breakpoint over here has been hit, so start async has run, and that looks good. We get some logging so far looking good, and then it all goes horribly wrong. So two things happened here that we might not have expected. The first um, is reasonably obvious because I've told you that this is sequential. So uh, this one started, it, we saw that breakpoint being hit, but this one never did get hit. Um, and the reason is that this start async never returns. It never returns a task. It just starts doing some long running work and kind of keeps going. What we want to do is pass back a task um, that says we started a workload, but we kind of started a background workload, um, and you can carry on. The reason this has thrown an exception is we triggered or we start, uh, configured a startup timeout of five seconds earlier on. And so after five seconds, the app went, well, you, you, haven't, you haven't finished with this start async method yet, so you haven't started the host. And so if we look at the um, output here, we never saw any of the host logging that we've seen previously saying the application started, and we just get this failed to start message. So we've hit our timeout because basically we screwed up the code here. So this is expecting us to trigger a long running background workload, not just do long running work immediately and start async. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to do uh, task.run here. Now this is still not like a great practice, so don't copy this. Um, but what I'm going to do here is, um, just paste in that long running work that we've got uh, into basically a fire and forget. You don't really want to be doing fire and forget on tasks, but we can do. Um, so we're creating a task by triggering task.run. We're just ignoring or forgetting about that task, um, and then we're letting our application run. So once we've created that, there's no actual async code in this method, so I'm going to now return uh, task, uh, completed task. And that's our start method now redefined. So we, we're firing this task off on the background. It will get scheduled on the thread pool somewhere. And then we're just saying, OK, we started up. Um, we've got no way of being notified if there's exceptions thrown in there. We've got no way of stopping that workload. Um, so it's not great. Um, but we'll see now that actually, if I copy that into both my tasks, uh, both of my background services and run this app again, then we should see that indeed this breakpoint has been hit, and now this breakpoint has been hit. So that sequential startup um, has run, and I, if I beat the cancellation token, um, then we see that the application started up. Curiously, I'm not seeing logging. What have I done wrong? It's now is the time to shout out if you can see why it's not logging. Uh, now I did hit a weird quirk with this app before, and I'll just rerun this to make sure I didn't hit weird key press. Started, started. Yeah, I think it fired off just before I managed to, to get through to that point. So if you beat the five second timeout, we had a little race there. Uh, this time it's now logging. So both of those services have started up successfully and they're both um, logging to the console. Um, as I say, they're both now starting in that sequential mode. If we wanted to, um, and uh, it's quite often if useful. If those services don't really depend on any uh, on one another for any reason, oops, I put my brace in the wrong place. Uh, let's turn this there and put a comma. Uh, and I'll just do o dot uh, services concurrently equals true. This is how we can then configure that we want them to start up together. So instead, the host will now um, actually attempt to fire off the start async on both of those at the exact same time or immediately one after the other at least, and then it will await but all of them completing and starting up. So that's how you can configure that new uh, Donut 8 feature if you need to. Um, so we've, we've kind of achieved our goal. We've completed um, this long-running application. 
Um, I don't really um, like that I've done this fire and forget stuff, so I think we should probably improve that. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get rid of this second instance now. Uh, we don't need time service two. But in time service one, I'm going to switch from using this background, uh, sorry, this I hosted service to, to instead implement this abstract class called background service. And background service adds one abstract method that we have to implement called execute async. Um, and this is where we can trigger our long running workloads. Um, and then the background uh, service implementation will handle starting that off correctly. So I'm going to go back to my original code here and part, put that in here, make this async. Really frustrates me that they named this stopping token instead of cancellation token and uh, made us have to do that. Um, so we've got uh, this execute async method, and we can still override start async and stop async for special cases, but generally we don't need to implement those at all. And so you'll see that that's got a lot simpler already. And background service implements iHosted service for us, um, and it does things properly. So it first creates a cancellation token source um, and sticks that in a field up here, uh, up here, sorry. Um, then it uh, calls into execute async, passing in the token from that cancellation token source and stores the task into this, uh, this field up here. Um, and that's also accessible via this property on the background service. So it hasn't awaited this. So it hasn't expected this to you know, start asynchronous work and it's just called into it and said, I want to store the task that you return, um, which we expect to happen pretty fast. Um, if for any reason that happens to complete entirely synchronously, which is possible, um, then it just bubbles that task back up, so any exceptions bubble up. Um, but otherwise, from this method, it just returns task completed task. So it has started that work off, but it's stored it into a task that it can access later. And that means that when the application is shutting down and stop async is called, um, it triggers the cancellation token source by calling cancel on it. That triggers the cancellation of this token passed into our execute async method. And then as long as we're cooperatively canceling in our execute async method, that will allow that code to stop um, doing any asynchronous work it was doing. Once it's triggered that cancellation, it basically starts a race. So it creates a task completion source here, and then it registers on the um, cancellation token that's passed into stop async, which will be linked to the shutdown timeout uh, that's been configured in the app. If that cancellation token cancels, then it's going to set cancelled on that uh, task completion source over here. So it's just kind of linking these two cancellation events together. And what that means is um, that uh, we then do this when any. And so basically this now is a race between the completion of our code in execute async, um, which we might hopefully cooperatively cancel, and the task from this task completion source, which is going to be uh, cancelled as soon as uh, the shutdown timeout is hit. So we've got in this application, 15 seconds for execute async to complete successfully. Um, otherwise, it would be forcefully um, started to shut down. So that's kind of what background service is doing on our behalf. And as you can see, it simplifies the story quite a lot because anytime we want to define these units of work, we just implement this one method. Uh, we don't have to think about storing tasks and dealing with cancellation token sources to do things properly. Um, and then everything just kind of works as we'd expect. Now, so far, we've done this in a console application. I and mean, then we've gone through and we've manually added all the things we need. And you might think there's quite a lot of ceremony there. Um, and that's true. And that's why Microsoft ship the worker service template. Um, so if I create this uh, project into my solution, you'll see that what it gives us is exactly what we just spent the last, what, 20 minutes building out, which is it sets up or brings in the hosting package we need. It creates the host, registers, in this case, just a dummy worker service uh, or background service here, uh, which is kind of doing what we were doing before. Builds and runs the host. Uh, it includes app settings, but it also includes the, the, the app settings.development.json so that we can have hierarchies of configuration in different environments. Um, and it basically sets everything up. So if you want to build these, these units of work for processing data or reading from queues, et cetera, just use the worker service template. You don't have to go through everything I've shown you. But hopefully, it was somewhat useful going into what uh, you know, happens behind the scenes to understand how this stuff all works. The final thing I'm going to show you as part of this demo is in the time service. I'm just going to show you that there is a brand new um, interface in .NET 8 called I Hosted a Lifecycle Service. Um, and if I, oops, uh, let's do implement that. You'll see what that asks us to implement is four additional methods. And generally, you might only implement one of these. The rest should just return a task completed task. But what this lets us do is have 
a very high precision control over the life cycle of the startup of these services. Uh, it's quite rare you need this, but basically there's a, there's a sequence that gets called on any of these, any iHosted service that's registered that also happens to Im implement this interface. Starting async will happen before any of the start asyncs are invoked, and started will happen afterwards, and then similar for stopping. The one time this could be particularly useful is if you have like database initialization work that you want to do and your hosted services depend on that database, you might want to make sure that maybe any migrations and things have run before the actual workloads kick off. And so if you register just one of these and in starting async, you do your database configuration, you can guarantee that that's going to be the very first thing that runs in your code. Once that's finished, then start async gets called on all your other hosted services and their workloads can begin. So that's one use case. It's pretty niche. It was added more for some framework stuff that Microsoft were building. Um, so it's pretty rare that you'd actually go in and implement that yourself. So I'm going to drop back to slides for a few minutes and then we'll look at some slightly more like real world uses for background services and how we can actually use this stuff in practice. So let's recap that host startup because we looked at code and I appreciate it's the end of a long day. So reading the code and trying to part, put in your head where all that task cancellation stuff um, happens might be quite difficult. So in our application, in Program CS, we built the host. We built that from the host application builder. And then on that iHost, we called that run async extension method. The run async extension method then called into start async on the iHost. And then it triggered the startup of any of those iHosted services that it can resolve from DI. I've shown it on the diagram here that it's sequential, so that's the default behavior, uh, remember, but you can configure that concurrent behavior if none of these have dependencies on one another. So really, the only reason you'd want to start these in order is if you know, the first service is doing something that has to be started before the second one then kicks off. Um, and that might be a reason to you know, have this dependency order. So once those have all started, that's when that um, application started cancellation token on iHost application lifetime got cancelled, and that's then signaling that the application has successfully started all of the, the registered units of work. And at that point, the iHost called into that um, wait for shutdown async method, um, and that's what then basically registered with the application stopping token, um, and then just awaited until that occurred, and that's what keeps the application alive uh, indefinitely. Then we've got options to signal the shutdown of those applications, and we've kind of touched on some of these. So by default, that console lifetime that's default for the generic host when you first introduce it um, is listening for various signals that might be uh, shutdown signals from a user. So in the terminal, if someone's typing control C, um, a sig int, that will trigger graceful shutdown. Control break um, and sig quit will shut, trigger the shutdown. And finally, like things like sig term. So if you're running this in a container and Docker stops your container, um, then that will trigger the graceful shutdown of your application as well. We also saw that if we wanted to shut this down at any point in code, we could just uh, inject the iHost application lifetime interface and call it stop application uh, method, and then that triggers that same graceful shutdown to begin. Um, if your app happens to be using environment.exit, if you're building these work services, just don't. Um, it's not really a good idea. Um, before .NET 6, it was, they tried to make that a graceful shutdown as well, but there were various um, deadlocks and race conditions that occurred. Um, so since .NET 6, they've abandoned trying to make it graceful and just accepted that that is a true terminate the app now, like stop the foreground and background threads and end um, the application. You shouldn't be using environment.exit in these applications to trigger shutdown and termination. You should use that um, interface that we've got there if you're doing it in code. So on that host shutdown sequence, um, shutdown occurs because maybe someone's pressed control C. On the console lifetime, that calls stop application on the host application lifetime. That triggers that uh, stopping token to be cancelled um, so that anyone that's listening and registered to that can no be notified that shutdown is beginning. That includes the wait for shutdown async method of, uh, added on the iHost which was basically waiting until that um, signal occurred. And then as soon as that occurred, it could fall through to the next line of code, which called stop async on the, the host. Then your hosted services are stopped. Um, again, by default, that will be sequential, and it will also be in reverse registration order. So the one that started last would be the first to stop. And again, you might have requirements where some of these have to stop in a particular order to like drain a queue or finish some processing. And if you do, leave it in this uh, kind of sequential mode. Otherwise, again, you could switch that to concurrent if you want to. At that point, the application stopped. Cancellation token got cancelled. So anyone that's listening to that is aware that the application has now basically finished everything and is about to exit. 
and then stop async completes and the, the main method resumes and then the, the process just exits normally. So that hopefully it sort of explains that life cycle a little bit better. So we can use these concepts to build these like long running background workloads. And I wanted to sort of talk about a few use cases that I've used these for practically. Um, the first is not necessarily that obvious, but it is a really nice scenario where we can offload work from ASP.NET Core requests. So typically in ASP.NET Core, you know, a request comes in, say it gets handled by a controller in MVC. We've got our code in that controller that goes off to a database, does a bunch of work, and eventually you know, can return some response to the user. And generally, those are going to be relatively quick, we hope, and you know, within uh, less than a second, we've probably returned data to the user. But if we have any of those that take a long time to gather the data, it's a particularly heavy piece of work maybe, um, we don't necessarily want a user in a web-based UI system sitting there hanging around waiting for the response. So what we can do instead is push that work, as soon as it's received into the controller, we can push that work onto a background service um, we'll look at how we can do this in code in a moment. But we can push that work onto the background service, and then we can just return an immediate response to the user and said acknowledged, basically. So we can return like an accepted uh, status code if it's an API, or we could return even uh, an accepted code, but we could include a token maybe so that the application can poll using that token to see if the work's finished and at some point get the results kind of asynchronously later on. And this is a nice way of making your applications more responsive if you know there's you know, a delay and the user doesn't necessarily have to be sat there waiting for the response before they can continue what they're doing. Another good scenario in ASP.NET Core is for things like refreshing caches. So say you have a cache in memory for 10 minutes with some data from a database that's quite heavy to gather. Um, that's great because your user is just getting it from the in-memory in cache. But at some point, one unlucky user is going to hit that cache when the data is expired after 10 minutes. And that user is then going to pay the cost of waiting for the database to be queried, the cache to be rebuilt, and then the response. So what we can do is kick off a background service that every nine minutes, say, is, is doing that database call and refreshing the data in the cache, which means it's always kept fresh. It's always kept within nine minutes old. Um, but it means that none of your users are ever going to hit that situation where the cache isn't populated with uh, non-stale data. So that's ASP.NET Core. There's a couple of good scenarios there. For worker services, um, a really powerful one is doing things like queue processing. So while we can offload work from a request to a background service in process, we could also offload it to an entirely separate service using something like a queue or a service bus. And this lets us build, start building those kind of event-driven or you know, sort of queue-driven uh, microservice architectures where we can distribute this work into lots of little microservices. And so we can just fire off one of these services that's polling a queue, for example, uh, doing a bunch of background work, and then um, just processing any messages that it gets. So to give you a, a real-world example, this is from my Pluralsight demo, so it's not like an actual real-world app, but the demo is heavily based on some stuff I did work on um, in a real company uh, where we were building out like a, a data processing pipeline um, where APIs were passing stuff onto queues, and then we had all sorts of background services um, processing. And so if I show you what the app's doing, um, it's basically an app for a tennis club, so it allows users to book courts, manage their membership, etc. But one of the features um, of this application is um, that there's a, an admin area where an administrator can upload results from like a, a tennis match or a set of tennis matches. So imagine there's a tournament happens and they want to publish the results and have them um, unloaded somewhere. So in V1 of this implementation, if I upload the scores, I'm going to click upload and then we wait. We wait, and we're not really sure anything's happening. The only reason we know something's happening is we've got this car little icon spinning around up here. But as a user, we're like, what? Eventually, we, we see this completed message, and so, great, it's done. And if I can find the right console window here. Uh, so this is the web application output. So you can see after it received that um, file, it's done a bunch of API calls to do some processing, and eventually, after about nine seconds, we, we were done. Now, as a user, that wasn't a great experience, and there's no real reason to keep a user sitting around um, waiting for that to happen. To understand kind of the implementation of that, um, basically, when that file is posted, it creates a temporary file name, creates a file stream over that, uh, for that new file, and basically copies from the uploading file into the file stream, repositions the file stream, and then calls this process async. Process async is what's doing the heavy lifting. It's calling APIs to get player details. It's simulating some long-running work here, and then um, posting results somewhere. 
So that all has to complete, and we saw that that took nine seconds, before then we delete the file and eventually redirect the user to that upload complete page. So one nice option would be is if we could offload that work. So in V2, that's what we do. We still create a temporary file name, we open the file stream, copy the file in, and then we close the file stream. Don't worry about this code, it's not really important for this part of the demo. Um, but the code then goes into here and it calls this or calls into this file processing channel and adds the file name to the channel. We'll look at the channel in a minute. Um, but you can see as soon as that happens, which should be basically instantaneous, it's all in process in memory, um, it then as long as that's been written, returns the user to the upload complete page. So this channel thing is basically my own class that wraps a channel. And this is a, a, a nice producer-consumer asynchronous API that we have now in .NET for doing sort of essentially in-memory queuing where we could have multiple producers and consumers reading data from this thing. Um, and it's in this system threading channels namespace. And it's extremely perfect for this scenario. So we, we wrap that channel and then the add file async method that we called from the controller just basically eventually writes that file, file name into that channel. That should generally be completely sort of synchronous and immediate. Then this read all async method down here is what's being listened to, or the, the consumer of this channel is listening to, and that's just a background service within this web application. And so what that does is it uses this await for in each syntax, which has been available for a while now, to asynchronously sort of await more data being available in that channel from this read all async method. And so once we get a file name from the channel, it just opens that file, processes it, and deletes it. And so what this means is, as a user, we've shifted that work um, away from their sort of their UI. So if I go to V2 endpoint, upload their scores, click upload, immediately they're told, great, upload complete, we've got your file. They can move on with their day and do something more useful. Um, but in the background, our web application uh, missed it running, but it has actually already run and, and processed that file. So it shifted that work onto uh, that channel. The channel read it and then processed it. So this is a really nice way to move that work away from the, the kind of the request flow. Um, it, there's a couple of potential gotchas here. So one is, you know, this is happening in one web service. So if we need to scale the processing work because it's quite intense, we'd have to scale this entire web service. Um, the other problem is if this web service dies partway through processing, then we've kind of lost the fact that that file was uploaded anywhere because it's, it's all in memory. It's all an in-memory queue. And so those are the couple of potential reasons where we might want to look to moving this to an out-of-process queue and a worker service. And so if I show you the code for what that looks like, um, we can then see how that sort of differs slightly. So in v3, we're doing the exact same thing as before, uploading and saving the file locally, just to get it from the user as quickly as possible into some storage location uh, on disk. It then writes to a channel. It's a different channel this time that that file has occurred, and again, redirects the user to the upload complete. So this channel, um, is a very similar implementation, but the thing listening or consuming this channel is a different background service. And what this one's doing is reading the file name from the channel and then using the AWS transfer utility, it's pushing this file to S3. So we're immediately pushing this somewhere that we can persist this file um, um, and we're just using the transfer utility to do that. Um, so Again, I push this to a background service within the web app just to avoid any delays with uploading S to S3, delaying the user. We've already got their files so they can, they can get their response. And then in the background, we just quickly upload this to S3. Um, locally, I'm running that using local stack. So when you see the demo, it will be a bit slow just because it's not real S3, but I never trust conference Wi-Fi for cloud demos. Um, so that offloads that work. And then in this application, so that's the web app there. In this application, I've got a separate worker service here, this score processor. And this thing is fired up at the same time, and it has a background service running here that's just listening uh, to a queue. So the first question might be, well, how did this queue, how does this help us? Because we just uploaded a file to S3. Well, one of the things you can do in Amazon is when a file is uploaded to S3, you can have a notification put onto a queue that says, hey, there's a new blob here. And that's what I've set up behind the scenes for this environment. So as soon as the S3 file was created, something was dropped on an SQS queue to say, hey, here's a new file. And so this service is reading from that queue. And in this while loop, it's just constantly polling the queue. And if it gets a message, it writes it to a channel within this worker service. Otherwise, it waits 10 seconds and just tries um, polling the queue again. Um, so that one's running. And then we've got this score processing service, which is another background service in that worker service project. And so this one is reading from that um, or consuming that channel 
and that channel is receiving messages from that have been read off of SQS. The reason I do it as two independent worker services or background services, sorry, is that this means that we can kind of have our queue reading work just constantly running and we're not then periodically delaying to process any files we've got. So we just, we're having one background service that's polling the queue, throwing them onto a channel. We have a second one that's just waiting for things to appear on the channel and then actually processing them. And so we're kind of separating those two distinct pieces of work. And so once we get the message uh, from there, this background service in its implementation here, we'll call this method. And this basically just accesses the object keys, the list of file names essentially in the blob that have been added. Uh, one or many might have been added and notified. It opens a file stream or an S3 stream over that file, and then it processes it just as we did before with the same processing code. And once it's done, it deletes the message. And so now we've got a degree of persistence. If that message isn't deleted, it will be picked up by another worker service after it's sort of, uh, sort of hidden period um, runs out. And so as long as this is item potent, item potent, uh, it means that we can, we can just sort of safely retry this workload until it eventually succeeds if anything weird happens. So that's those two running together. And um, it's not going to be particularly exciting because you can kind of guess what this is going to look like. But if I go back to my app and go fee free, upload is complete immediately. The application is now hopefully, um, it's taken that file, it's created a temporary file name to upload it. And I think it takes a while because I'm on local stack, but at some point that file will appear in the kind of the local stack instance, which is just like fake S3 running on my machine. Um, I'm going to open up another window as well so that we can see the queue reader. So yeah, this, this has now logged that it successfully uploaded the file to S3. This queue reader then picked up a message from the queue on its next read through that said, hey, you've got this new file by this name. And then in a second, once it's finished um, pulling that down from my very slow local S3, um, we should see the processing um, logging begin to appear. I'll wait one second or two just to see if that does happen. There it goes. So now we've got that processing happening, but this is the web service on the left. The other one on the right is our worker service. And so we've got these two independent, essentially microservices now with discrete uh, responsibilities. So there's a couple of like semi-advanced things that I just want to touch on in the last few minutes we've got. Um, so if I go back to the queue reading service um, here, you'll note that all of this while loop is inside a try block. Um, and so I've got this exception handling here. Exception handling is really important in these ex, um, execute async methods because as I said earlier, if you don't handle exceptions and they bubble up, then that will just trigger the application or the host to entirely stop. And so what I'm doing is here is if I get an operation cancelled exception, that could happen and that's expected because if the app is shutting down at any point, then this cancellation token will be cancelled. And so we'd see that exception bubble up. Um, so I log that that's happened, but then I don't really worry about it. Um, and then any other exceptions for now, I'm just logging a critical message. In either case, we end up in this finally block. And what this does is complete the channel. So the nice thing about channels is you can, can sig signal from a consumer to producers uh, or producers to consumers that one end or the other has finished. And so in this case, the producer is saying, look, if I've crashed out for some reason, I'm not going to be adding anything new to that channel. So as soon as the consumer of this channel has finished reading all the items from it, it knows it's not going to get any more and it breaks its um, async uh, for each loop. So what we're doing here is just saying, well, if this has failed, we're not going to be writing anything new to the channel. And then in the score processing service, again, we, we have a try block around this work here. Um, and so one option is that this will break when that completed writer or the writer gets completed, in which case in the happy path, we f flow to the finally. Otherwise, if we have an exception while we're processing, then we still hit one of these uh, catch blocks here. But in either case, once we reach this finally, that we then trigger programmatically the shutdown of this worker service. Because if there's nothing new going to be read from the queue, there's nothing else that we can ever do. Um, or you know, if the processing from the queue has crashed, then we probably also want to stop. And then we should be sort of alerting on that and maybe looking at why those services failed. The other thing I want to point out in both of these is I've used cancellation tokens a bit differently. So in this background service, there's a stopping token and you can see that all, all the way through the code, I'm you know, listening to the token, I'm passing the token into async methods as a good citizen. So that means as soon as the application is being shut down, these async methods will be canceled and will just kind of exit from this piece of work. Um, and that's kind of the queue reading side. On the processing side, I did it a bit differently though. There's a stopping token still here, but I'm not actually um, listening to that at all in my code. And I explicitly, in fact, disabled my warnings telling me I should do so. And that's because in this particular piece of code, if 
we're shutting down. What I actually want to try and do is drain this channel or let any in-flight in processing finish. And so this app has like a timeout of one minute set for its shutdown. And so this has one minute for this code to complete reading anything that's been added to that channel. And then hopefully break out of this for each loop naturally and then just shut down and end. Um, but that's a conscious decision there not to cancel this immediately and to try and let this basically race that cancellation token of the, the shutdown timeout. Um, so that's two important things. The last one is a really unusual gotcha that I ran into one time. Um, so we saw earlier that Start Async has to return a task very quickly for the app to be start up successfully. If you have any synchronous work in Execute Async before your first await, you have to remember that this method is running at that point synchronously. And so here I'm just throwing in a Fred sleep. But if you were like calling a database and the only APIs you had were synchronous APIs and that took a little bit of time uh, to do the database calls and get whatever you're pulling back from the database, then actually this method is running synchronously and that's blocking start async from finishing because that task hasn't yet returned to start async. And so until this first await, uh, we could be running synchronously. And if that happens, you're a bit stuck. I mean, if you can switch to async methods here, you should definitely do that. That's the best solution. But if for any reason you can't and you have got this little bit of long running synchronous work, then the trick um, uh, recommended to me by David Fowler is put in a task yield um, and immediately you know, yield the task back here. And that just means that we immediately turn this method async um, uh, before we start doing this synchronous work. And then that just comes out of the async state machine. So it's an unusual gotcha, but if you run into it, you can be sort of left wondering why your app hasn't started up um, for some weird and unusual reason. So that's pretty much it uh, in terms of code. Uh, I'll just pop back into slides to wrap up. So I just want to recap the, a couple of the key points that I want people to kind of leave with um, when you're using these things in, in real life. So definitely avoid blocking code and start async. You want that code to just return a task very quickly. The best option is just to not implement iHosted service yourself and use the background service um, abstract class that does it for you. As I've just shown you there, if you do have that weird edge case where you might have a lot of synchronous code that happens before your first await in Execute Async, you just need to make sure that you either get rid of that synchronous work, allow your timeout to be long enough for it to run, or do what I did there and just put a, a task yield in. Consider registration order for your background services. So as I say, by default, those will start up in a, a sequential manner, um, which is the historic and standard behavior of this thing all along. And that means that you can register them uh, into DI in a particular order so that they can depend on one another. If the, the final service that you want to register needed service one to have done something, or at least started doing something, that registration order can be honored. But if you don't need that, which is pretty rare, to be honest, uh, if you are sort of coupling these things together, you want to try and avoid that and maybe switch to channels. Um, but if you can't for, uh, you can't for any reason, then leave that sequential mode. Otherwise, um, switch to the concurrent option. So that was on that host options. We can start and stop concurrently just to make things a little bit quicker. Um, really consider how you're doing your exception handling. Try not to let anything unhandled bubble up and, and deal with it in the right way. And that might be that you stop the application, or it might be, as you saw, we might do something else like say that we've completed a writer on a channel so that we can signal other uh, background services that we've finished uh, producing new content for them. Um, consider how you do that cooperative cancellation in your code. So sometimes you do want to cooperatively cancel your execute async and shut it down almost instantly. Other times you might want to let it drain workloads, in which case you don't want to listen to the token that's passed into that execute async method because that will trigger your code to stop. Um, and then just a reminder that there's this I hosted lifecycle service interface that gives you those four new lifecycle events for a hosted service. Very rare that I can think of anyone really needing that. As I say, one scenario might be sort of doing database setup very early on in your app. So that's, that's it. We can all get off and go to beers or trains or whatever we've got to do. Um, that's the link to the Pluralsight course. So if you did enjoy this, but you want to go deeper um, and you've got a subscription, then uh, you can check that out. Otherwise, um, thanks very much. I'm here at the Elastic stand for the next couple of days. So if you have any questions or something pops into your head tomorrow, uh, feel free to grab me. Otherwise, uh, thank you and have a good, good evening. <laughs>